<laughs> Hi there. Okay. My Hi. name is Sun Young Yoon with the International Alliance of Women. I'm one of the co-drivers of the Feminist and Women's Movement Action Plan, along with Melissa Upreti and Krishanti de Mirage of the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers University. I am here with Charlotte Bunch, <clears throat> who is the founding director of that center and still the senior scholar. She's also a distinguished professor in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers. So we're here to talk about the gender equality architecture reform. That's a mouthful or what we call the GEAR campaign that actually created UN Women 10 years ago. So Charlotte, uh, we know that UN Women is really unique among UN agencies because it's historically attached to the feminist and women's movements. Can you tell us, first of all, what was your role in the GEAR campaign? And what do you think was really the reason why it succeeded? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for doing this important historical work. Let me just say one thing. It's not only the GEAR campaign, it's throughout the history of the UN. The things that have to do with women have always been a collaboration between women NGOs, the International Alliance of Women, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. They were doing this long before we were. And to me, that's a really important piece of the history that I build upon, which is the UN has moved on women's rights precisely because non-governmental organizations, civil society, women have seen the UN as an important arena for advancing issues, not only of equal rights, but also of peace and development. And that includes women from the global south as well as the global north. Uh, and I think it's really a, a part of our legacy that I want to celebrate. So my involvement in the GEAR campaign uh, is really directly connected to that because my first engagement with the UN was through the UN World Conferences on Women. Ah, and yes. I was out there in the world as a feminist in the 70s and all of a sudden I learned that the UN was gonna do a World Conference on Women in Mexico City and I was a lesbian feminist at the time. And I was like, okay, there better be some lesbians present. <laughs> and I was an organizer. So I helped organize a lesbian caucus. I didn't go myself. Uh, we raised money and sent other people. Um, but really, I think from the beginning, my sense of the UN is that it's an arena where women uh, can move new ideas and particularly in the past, maybe less so today, there weren't that many places women could meet internationally. Absolutely. So the UN, yeah. UN was a really important one. So I, I just want to say that because I feel like I picked up the baton um, in the 1980s and 90s through the World Conferences on Women in the process of both the Nairobi Conference and the Beijing Conference. And that's really what enabled me to imagine doing gear uh, and the gender architecture because as a feminist activist, I thought the last thing I cared about was structures of the United Nations. Uh, so, you know, it was not on my list of things I was going to change in the world uh, when I got out of, you know, my movements. But working through particularly Beijing, and we're now also celebrating that anniversary, um, I began to see the real potential of the UN as an arena for advancing women's rights, but also just giving women in movements and in NGOs the space to see how global ideas and policies develop and to be a part of that. So my role in the GEAR campaign follows directly from that. I, I was one of, um, as the Center for Women's Global Leadership, we were the co-directors with We Do uh, of the Linkage Caucus the Linkage Caucus grew out of the Beijing World Conference in 1995, and we held meetings at every CSW, Commission on the Status of Women, to try to bring together the different issues and to, to present a kind of more, um, I would call it a more women's human rights whole perspective, not just single issue. 
And every year after Beijing, we did one of these at the Commission on Status of Women. So in 2006, when Kofi Annan appointed a panel um, called the Coherence Panel. <laughs> Let's hope it was coherent. <laughs> no. not, not, I think, my favorite name, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, when he created that panel, um, there were three women on the panel out of 15 or so. And we were outraged. This was, you know, 2006. This was at 10 years after Beijing. We were already supposed to be 50-50 and everything. And so we first held uh, a meeting of the Linkage Caucus and uh, had some um, demonstrations and protested and demanded more women on the panel. But it was really that process that got me um, and June Zeitlin uh, of We Do involved in what became the GEAR campaign. So CWGL was always one of the lead organizations uh, in the beginning with We Do in June, uh, later with Bonnie Dougal when June left We Do, uh, Bonnie Dougal became the co-chair. So throughout this process, I was one of the co-chairs and therefore part of the global organizing group. So uh, Charlotte, I'm gonna stop you there for a moment. I seem to be uh, frozen, frozen on my screen. Am I okay on yours? You're, you're just doing just fine. Okay, fine. Um, well, you are kind of looking frozen, but we're going to just keep talking because it's, okay. it's probably going to still work. You're looking great. All right. Um, I'm going to stop you there for a minute to, to reflect a little bit on you. Mm -hmm. So you founded the Center for Women's Global Leadership. Right. And then you saw the potential for the UN as another global place for UN women. What drives you, do you think, to, to imagine that you can found all these things? Like, are you, are you, <laughs> um, it would be really nice if you shared a little bit your inspiration. I mean, like, where's your strength? Where do you get that? Well, let's start with inspiration. <laughs> I, I, am, I am a child of the U.S. 1960s, um, and in particular, I began my little steps toward a life of political activism in the civil rights movement in North Carolina in the 1960s. So I was inspired by the John Lewis's um, and the other organizers, uh, including the women, um, in the South, particularly African-American women, whose names we are now finally beginning to hear more frequently, who really fought the struggle against racism and civil rights in the South of the US. And I was just very lucky that I was a college student at the time. And through the Methodist student movement, I was involved in uh, support demonstrations, uh, I, I went to Montgomery at the time of the Selma Montgomery March as part of a student-led support group that helped with housing and helped with logistics. So I got to see up front, very young, um, how exciting it is to imagine making change. And I, I feel very fortunate for that. that. That was really my initial role model. And over the years, um, it's continued to be people who are doing this work in different arenas that have inspired me. And also in the 1960s, we made change. Um, we know yes. today we're still dealing with racism. We know that, you know, it, it isn't that everything changed and it's all perfect, but we saw ourselves making change. So I, I wasn't beginning um, those organizations. I was just a foot soldier. But in that process, I, I started to learn that if you have a good idea, and if you find the right people to work with, um, and this brings me kind of to your question about why was the campaign successful? Yeah, yeah. To me, one of the greatest successes of the year campaign was that we tried to work with a lot of different people. We mm -hmm. didn't see ourselves doing this alone. We worked across lines. We worked with people in the UN who, saw the need for these changes. We worked with people from uh, international NGOs and development and human rights NGOs who were now interested because of the work of the women's movement 
in women's rights, but who understood, and I always describe the Dear campaign as a women-led or a feminist-led broad coalition, because we could never have had that influence without the Amnesty Internationals and the Oxfams and the Novibs who joined our campaign and had a lot of influence that women's rights groups don't always have. So part of, I think, the success of the global cam of the campaign, the global campaign for gear, was reaching out and keeping the leadership as a feminist group and having international North and South balanced leadership, having groups like Dawn, having groups uh, from the Global South, Asia Pacific Women's Watch, in the regions, leading the campaign in their own areas and contributing to the strategy and the ideas. So to me, the success was having a clear idea what you were trying to do. We weren't, we, we wanted to change everything, but we had a specific thing we were trying to do and then engaging a lot of people in it. Perfect, perfect. So um, some of us would imagine that UN Women is rather unique in that history of UN agencies. I don't know that it was a movement that created UNICEF, for example, or UNFPA, but here it has that special relationship and it's created also these global advisory groups. I think you serve on one of them. Um, I, I, I did in the first five years. Perfect. I'm not any longer, but yeah. yes, I did. Yeah, but yeah. you've been watching UN Women right. now for 10 years. Right. Um, do you have any observations about what it's good at? Uh, any particular example that you want to share? Well, I think that um, what, it, what it's good at that we wanted is bringing together um, the experiences of women and women's advocates in different areas uh, inside of the UN. And let me give an example. I've done a lot of work at the UN on violence against women over the years. And we used to work with the different women's groups, with UNIFEM, with the Division for the Advancement of Women. Um, but it was hard to get those groups to work with each other, to be quite honest, because <laughs> they were competing for very minor resources. They, they were competing for space where nobody had very much. Um, and so one of the goals of the GEAR campaign and the process of creating human women was to bring these disparate pieces that had been created at different times in the UN's history and to bring them together so you had a more unified focus. Um, and I think that's also where I've seen success. So. I think we've seen in the last decade, the UN taking violence against women to a new level of attention. Uh, both Ban Ki-moon, the previous Secretary General, and Antonio Guterres have made very strong statements and commitments to this issue. And I think UN Women backs that up. It has brought together the work of different parts of the UN system on violence and helped create a sense that the UN is attacking as a whole against women. So that when the uh, COVID epidemic started, it didn't take long for UN women to pick up on what civil society was telling them about the impact of the uh, COVID crisis on women at home and domestic violence. So you get the Secretary General speaking to something that would never have happened 25 years earlier. You know, so it you, would have, yeah. yeah. Right, so do you think that one could say that because there was this unified entity then at the UN and uh, still with scarce resources, but they've actually had beyond advocacy, do you think it's possible we could say that UN Women actually has helped change women's lives on the ground at home? Well, I think they're um, seeking to be a part of that. I, I don't know how much we can say because they never got the resources that they were supposed to have. Um, and that's probably the biggest failure of the GEAR campaign and of UN Women um, and of, I would say, the UN governments, um, mm -hmm. that UN Women was never resourced the way it should have been 
for the job it's supposed to do. Um, and that's, that's my biggest critique, not of UN Women, but of the UN um, in creating UN Women. And once more thinking women can do it all with no money, with no resources. It's nothing new. This happens to our NGOs, this happens, but it was such a disappointment. It's true that when UN Women was created, it was the economic crisis in the world. But even when things got better, their budgets went up, but never to the scale of a UNICEF um, or UN agencies working on other issues. So I still feel there is a, that resistance within the UN to invest in women to the degree that, I mean, it's ironic that we now see in the COVID epidemic, articles all over the world about women leaders who've handled the pandemic, <laughs> probably the best in the world. And yet exactly. we're still not investing in women's leadership as a key part of the solution to these problems. So you and women still has to deal with that problem. Um, it's not their fault, but they haven't been able to overcome it completely. So what if uh, during this anniversary year of UN Women, that UN Women actually tried to leverage the uh, special relationship it has with the feminist and women's movement to get some of that financing? Like, do you think that would work? I think they should try. Um, <laughs> I think they're, I think, I know the women's uh, funds have been really trying to work toward that and have leveraged more money. Um, and I think, I think it could be one of the possibly um, better things to come out of the whole period of the epidemic. Um, so I hope they will try to do that. I, I think UN Women needs to build its, uh, continue to and expand its ability to partner with civil society. Um, not just see civil society as supporting UN Women, but also as really bringing the tough issues and sort of the tough challenges to light and um, really partnering. I, I feel that there's still, I mean, all bureaucracies have this tendency to bureaucratize their relationships. So even in the advisory group, I would say that I probably have had as much if not more influence when there was somebody in UN Women who really believed that either my organization or groups of women would really make a difference on the issue than I have in the official advisory capacity. So we fought for those advisory capacities, but unfortunately it's still the case that it just matters who the people are. The degree to which civil society is engaged still depends primarily on who the person on the staff is and what their understanding of how important that is. I, I think the director has that understanding, but it doesn't necessarily transmit throughout the organization. Um, I would like to see more of that. And Perfect. this is a good, mo this is a good <laughs> moment for it. This is a good moment to put forward recommendations. Exactly. Yeah. One last thought that we would appreciate from you. So we know there's a whole new generation of young feminists of all genders. What would be your recommendation to you and women on how to reach out to them? Bring them um, in. Go where they are. Ah, thank you. I, I think that every time we talk about reach out and bring in, we should be talking about how we reach out and move with the people who are moving on an issue. So Black Lives Matter has perhaps done that um, in this moment around racism, that people realize it's just, it's not just a matter of bringing them, people of color, into white organizations. It's about white organizations or majority white organizations going where the people are and being there with them in support of that. I think the same is true with young women. Young women mm -hmm. are very active out there. They really do care but they don't necessarily go first to the UN. I didn't go to the UN until 20 years after I began my activism as a student. Um, you, you 
<laughs> I mean, yes, you should bring people into meetings and give them the opportunity to engage. But above all, human women needs to go where the young women are, go to the Me Too movements on the, you know, online. I mean, now we're not able to go places in the same way, but engage with the issues and the people, the young women, um, and see how what UN Women is doing could incorporate that better. And I think that's true, not just for UN Women. I'd say mm -hmm. that's true for all kinds of organizations that are always lamenting, where are the young women? Well, are you going where they are? Um, I teach, so I'm very lucky. I, yes, I was I going get to a say, you're that, in touch you know, with them. <laughs> right. I'm in touch because I teach. It's, it's yeah. a structural, but I'm so happy that I have that structural yeah. engagement because otherwise, you know, I, I might not have any sense of that. In fact, it's one reason I don't want to retire because I feel like that engagement with young women in my classes, and luckily I, I'm only qualified to teach women's studies, so I teach things that are about activism and about caring, and so I, I meet them and I, I see what they care about, and they enable me to think about how to present my experience and what we've learned um, and connect them, connect them to our history. Some are, some are interested, but they're only interested, well, that's it. some are just really smart and interested, but they're mostly interested if it can teach and help them see something that they might want to learn and need to know. So the lessons that I mentioned earlier about the importance of coalitions that reach out widely um, of having a clear goal that, you know, we all want to change a lot, but having some clear goals about what are the specifics that you can change. These, these lessons that we learn with the GEAR campaign or any successful campaign, there's a way that young people can learn from that, but they learn it if we bring what we've learned to what they see as the issues and engage, not by expecting them to just come to where we are. Charlotte, this has been great. Thanks so much for being with us. We, um, we see you as a role model, of course, and for intergenerational dialogue, you've got it. Thanks so much. Thank you. It was wonderful <laughs> to talk to you about all of this. I